reading through the Bible in one year. August 11th, 1 Samuel chapter 1, Romans chapter 1, Jeremiah 39, and Psalms one thir- rather Psalms 13 and 14. Yeah, this is going to be a day. We can do it. I believe in us. All right, since we're in a new book, let's go ahead and read the introduction. 1 Samuel records the establishment of Israel's monarchy. About 1050 BC, Samuel led Israel for many years in the uh, combined roles of prophet, priest, and judge. After the people demanded a king like those of the other nations, chapter 8, God directed Samuel to anoint Saul as Israel's first king. When Saul turned from God, David was anointed by Samuel to succeed him. After David killed the giant Goliath, he was brought to Saul's court, eventually becoming the leader of Saul's armies. Saul's subsequent violent jealousy forced David to flee. The book closes with Saul's death in battle and looks forward to David's reign. First Samuel's author is unknown, but Samuel himself may have written portions of the book, as we see in 1 Chronicles 29.29. Let's begin, shall we? Now there was a certain man from Rephath- sorry, Ramathiam Zophim, from the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of jo- uh, Joram, yep, Joram, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuth, an Ephraimite. Now he had two wives, the name of one is Hannah, and the other, and the name of the other was Penaniah. And Penaniah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now that man would go up from his city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to Yahweh of hosts in Shiloh. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests to Yahweh there. And the day came that Elkanah sacrificed, and he would give uh, portions to Penaniah, to, uh, his wife, and to all her sons and her daughters. But to Hannah he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah. But Yahweh had closed her womb. Her rival, however, would provoke her bitterly to irritate her because Yahweh had closed her womb. And so it would happen year after year. As often as she went up to the house of Yahweh, she would provoke her. So she wept and would not eat. Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? And why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Then Hannah rose after eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat by the doorpost of the temple of Yahweh. And she, bitter of soul, prayed to Yahweh and wept despondently. And she made a vow and said, O Yahweh of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a seed amongst men, then I will give him to Yahweh all the days of his life, and a razor shall never come upon his head. Now it happened, as she multiplied her praying before Yahweh, that Eli was watching her mouth. As for Hannah, she was speaking in her heart, only her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. So Eli thought she was drunk. Then Eli said to her, How long will you make yourself drunk? Put away, sorry, put away your wine from you. But Hannah answered and said, No, my lord, I am a woman oppressed in spirit. I have neither drunk wine nor strong drink, but I have poured out my soul before Yahweh. Do not consider your maidservant as a vile woman, for I have spoken until now out of my great complaint and provocation. Then Eli answered and said, Go in peace. May the God of Israel grant your petition that you have asked of him. And she said, Let your servant woman find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. Then they arose early in the morning and worshipped before Yahweh, and turned back and came to their house in Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and Yahweh remembered her. Now it happened in due time that Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son, and she named him Samuel, saying, because I have asked, uh, rather asked him of Yahweh. Samuel meaning, uh, doesn't show it. Okay. Then 
The man Elkanah went up with all his household to offer to Yahweh the yearly sacrifice and pay his vow. But Hannah did not go up, for she said to her husband, I will not go up until the young boy is weaned. Then I will bring him, that he may appear before Yahweh and stay there forever. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what is good in your eyes. Remain until you have weaned him. Only may Yahweh establish his word. So the woman remained and nursed her son until she weaned him. Now, when she had weaned him, she took him up with her, and with a three-year-old bull and one ephah of flour and a jug of wine, and brought him to the house of Yahweh in Shiloh. And the boy was young, or rather, although the boy was young. And they slaughtered the bull and brought the young boy to Eli. And she said, O my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to Yahweh. For this young boy I prayed, and Yahweh has given me my petition which I asked of him. So, I have also dedicated him to Yahweh. As long as he lives, he is dedicated to Yahweh. So, he worshipped Yahweh there. That's all the notes. Let's move on now to Romans chapter 1. <sighs> Since we're in a new book, let's read the introduction. Romans, is the longest and most systematically reasoned of Paul's letters. Paul announces its theme in chapter 1, verses 16 through 17. The gospel is God's power for salvation, because it shows us that the righteousness of God is through faith for all who believe. Paul explains the need for justification through faith because of sin, and chapter 1, verse 16, through chapter 4, verse 25. Then he spells out the results of justification by faith in terms of both present experience and future hope, chapters 5 through 8. In the next three chapters, he expresses his sorrow that many of his fellow Israelites have not embraced the gospel, and he wrestles with the theological implications of this in chapters 9 through 11. He concludes by describing how the gospel should affect affect one's everyday life in chapters 12 through 16. Paul wrote this letter to Rome about A.D. 57. So that was its explanation. Mine is pretty simple. Um, I go into a lot of detail in this book because there's so much detail that's just right there on the surface to pull out. Um... The big things to note in this book are that, uh, as was previously mentioned, this is essentially a systematic theology textbook. It gives us all of the information we need to know about God. Remember, Paul is writing to people who are, in some cases, Jews, many may be Gentiles. He hasn't yet met them, but he's assuming that they are Christians within that area. So, he's sending a letter to them, hoping to come and visit them himself, which, as we know, he does. However, because he can't be there initially to give him all of his normal preparatory uh, uh, sermons and, and lessons, he sends it in this book, And this is a fantastic book. If you're a baby Christian, this is a great book to read over and over and over again. It's not that long. I know it says 16 chapters, but um, you can read through it in about an hour, give or take, and just read through it once a day for two or three weeks. It'll give you most of the information you need to know on on a simple basis of what it means to be a Christian, why we are Christians, why God needed to send his son to begin with, the sacrifice of Jesus and what it did for people, and then how now we should live. There's two sections to this book. The first one is what I call the orthodoxy or the doctrinal section. And then the second is the orthopraxy. That's the, you know, given the, the doctrinal information from the beginning, how now shall we live our lives in light of that? Let's go ahead and begin. Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, meaning sent one, having been set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, 
who was designated as the Son of God in power, according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we received grace and apostleship for the obedience of faith among the Gentiles for the sake of his name. Remember, name doesn't just mean the, the, the things you say out loud, but it's... Um, it refers to the character and the nature and the uh, reputation of the one to whom it is spoken. Where's my spot? There we go, verse 6. Uh, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are beloved of God in Rome called as saints, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God, whom I serve in my spirit in the gospel of his Son, is my witness as to how, without ceasing, I make mention of you always in my prayers earnestly asking if, perhaps now at last, by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you, so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you, that you may be strengthened, that is, to be mutually encouraged, while among you, by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been prevented so far so that I may uh, have some fruit among you also, even as the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation to both Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. In this way, for my part, I am eager to proclaim the gospel to you also who are in Rome. We're now at the statement, the purpose statement of this text. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, For it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek or Gentile. For in it, the righteousness righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, but the righteous will live by faith. Now, this next section talks about the need for for God to... um, First off, to come and to save his people. And also, why it is necessary that um, we need a Savior. This is kind of broken out through different sections. And as you see the text in front of you, you'll see this line, God gave them over, God gave them over, and God gave them over. Repeating that God... (sighs) In the the kindness and severity of God. When people continue to rebel against him, God creates barriers that stop people from, from proceeding to more and more sin. And he prevents them. But as they keep railing against God's barrier, eventually he just opens it up and allows them to pour through into the next level of depravity. God is being kind and trying to stop them, but he also wants to allow them to live their life as they see fit, to pursue whatever it is that they desire, even if it is, in the end, their own destruction. So, we'll see this kind of played out over and over. But the beginning of all of this is tying back to verse 16, when Paul says that he is not ashamed of the gospel. Other people are ashamed of the gospel. Other people are afraid of the gospel. But Paul is not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. This will come up later on, but for for Greeks, even for Jews, this was a laughable, stupid idea. But what is the gospel? The gospel has its power in the death of God. Who wants to worship a dead God? Who wants to worship a God who can die? This is why it's foolishness to so many people. It's foolishness to the Jew and foolishness to the Gentile. 
This is a recurring theme. We're going to see it quite a bit as it comes up. But we're not ashamed of this. Why? Because as he explains here, it is not just here, but over the next four chapters, it is necessary for God to take our place because we can never do it on our own. We can't keep the law of God. We can't do the things that God requires. We can't serve God as we read in Matthew chapter 5 in perfection as God requires. So we need to redeem ourselves. We need to be redeemed. We can't do it on our own. So like I said, this is a systematic book. The next section here, um, 18 through, I think it's 31, might be 32. I always get it wrong. Describes the necessity of a savior. The fact that nobody stands unaccused before our holy and perfect and righteous king. Verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. What does that mean? People know the truth of God. They know the truth of who he is. They know it in their heart of hearts, but they rebel against him. Suppressing that truth so they can live their lives however they want. Verse 19, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God has made it evident to them. They're without excuse. Verse 20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, both his eternal power and divine nature, having been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, maybe not by name, but they knew God existed, looking at creation, right? They did not glorify him as God or give thanks, but they became futile, vain in their thoughts, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, these are those people who look down their nose at you, the overintelligent atheist who... (laughs) laughs away. What do you mean? You need a God to serve? You can't. Look, we've got the science that we can trust in that changes every other week. We've got the science that we can prove that can't really be proven because in a year or 10 years or a hundred years, they're going to change their mind on what they think happened. They just added a couple billion years to the age of the universe. Why? Because they couldn't seem to fit all the stuff in in the first 14.6 billion. So now it's like 18 point something billion that they assume that the universe is in age. It'll change again. 5, 10, 15 years, they'll do it again. But this is the science in which they say we can trust Because they're looking for anything else to serve other than the God who created them. Continuing on. For even though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God or give thanks, became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools, suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. And exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an an image and the likeness of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. They're worshiping the creature rather than the one who created them. For the atheist, this is humanism. But what what is humanism other than worshiping man? Verse 24, therefore, because they continued to live in this way and to reject God, God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity. He gave them just what they wanted so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. 
For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the creator who was blessed forever. Amen. Because they did this, verse 26, for this reason, God gave them over to now dishonorable passions. For their females exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also, the males abandoned their natural function of the female and burned in their desire toward one another. Males with males committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. And even in this, they didn't see uh, fit to acknowledge God. And God gave them over to an unfit mind to do those things which are not proper. Having been filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, which we read about. It's not just actual murder, but it's hatred, right? Strife, deceit, malice. They are gossips, uh, slanderers, haters of God, violent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the righteous requirement of God, that those who practice such things uh, are, are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but they heartily give approval to those who practice them. That is why we need a savior. We'll go into more of this tomorrow. Let's move on to Jeremiah 39. Now, when Jerusalem was captured in the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his military force came to Jerusalem and laid siege to it. In the eleventh year of Zedekiah, in the fourth month, in the ninth day of the month, the city was breached. Then all the officials of the king of Babylon came in and sat down at the middle gate. Nergal, Sel, uh, Sar Ezer, uh, Semgar, Nebu, uh, Sar Sechem, the Reb Saris, Nergal, Sel, Ezer, um, the Rabmag, and all the rest of the officials of the king of Babylon. Now it happened that when King Zedekiah, rather Zedekiah the king of Judah, and all the men of war saw them, they fled and went out of the city at night by way of the king's garden through the gate between the two walls. And he went, toward, he went out toward the Arabah. But the military force of the Chaldeans pursued them and overtook Zedekiah in the plains of Jericho. And they took him and brought him up to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon at Riblah, in the uh, land of Hamath. And he spoke judgment on him. Then the king of Babylon slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes at Riblah. The king of Babylon also slaughtered all the nobles of Judah. Then he blinded Zedekiah's eyes and bound him in fetters of bronze to bring him to Babylon. Remember what we said before? He's going to see him eye to eye. He allowed him to see that his refusal to go out to the Chaldeans ended in the result of his entire family and everyone who trusted in him being slaughtered before him. And those were the last things he ever saw. Verse 8. The Chaldeans also burned with fire the house of the king and the houses of the people. And they tore down the walls of Jerusalem. As for the, the rest of the people who remained in the city, the defectors who had gone over to him, and the rest of the people who remained, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard, took them away into exile in Babylon. But some of the poorest of the people who had nothing, Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard, had them remain in the land of Judah and gave them vineyards and fields at that time. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave a command about Jeremiah through Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard, saying, Take him and set your eyes to look after him and do nothing harmful to him, but rather deal with him just as he speaks to you. So, Nebuzaradan um, the captain of the bodyguard sent word, along with uh, Nebuchadnezzar, 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 
the Rabsaris, and Nergal Sarezer, the Rabmag, and all the leading officers of the king of Babylon. They even sent and took Jeremiah out of the court of the guard and gave him over to Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, to take him home. So he stayed among the people. Now the word of Yahweh had come to Jeremiah while he was confined in the court of the guard, saying, Go and speak to Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, saying, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I am about to bring my words on this city for calamity and not for prosperity, and they will take place before you on that day. But I will deliver you on that day, declares Yahweh, and you will not be be given into the hand of the men of whom you are terrified." For it will certainly provide, rather, for I will certainly provide you escape, and you will not fall by the sword, but you will have your own life as spoil, because you have trusted in me, declares Yahweh. Let's conclude today in Psalms 13 through 14. How long, O Yahweh, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart all the day? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Look and answer me, O Yahweh my God. Give light to my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. Lest my enemy says, I have overcome him. And my adversaries rejoice that I am shaken. But I have trusted in your loving kindness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to Yahweh, because he has dealt bountifully with me. Psalm 14 The wicked fool says in his heart, There is no God. They act corruptly. They commit abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. Yahweh looks down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there is any who, or anyone who has insight, anyone who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. Altogether, they have become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do all the workers of iniquity not know? Who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon Yahweh? There they are in great dread, for God is with the righteous generation. You would put to shame the counsel of the afflicted, but Yahweh is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion when Yahweh restores his captive people. May Jacob rejoice. May Israel be glad. That's it for today. That's all of the notes and also all of the text. God willing, we'll be back back tomorrow. Behold the word of the Lord.